Welcome to the Board Theater. Thank you for being here tonight. My name is Robin Ashworth. I am the Vice Chair of the Board of Directors of the Bird Theater. Um, I would like to take this opportunity, if you wouldn't mind, just to remind you that this is a not-for-profit organization and we function largely, almost exclusively, on grants and donations that come from this community. Um, this uh, lovely theater, The Bird, as you know, is nearly 100 years old and we are working actively and consistently behind the scenes to do things like restore um, things that you can see, things that you can't see. And in the last uh, couple of years during COVID, we've managed to renovate the HVAC system. Um, we have plans to do more restoration work of electric and a lot of the beautiful um, uh, decorative things that you see, but in any case, I just want you to have confidence that uh, this beautiful organization is in wonderful hands. Our uh, executive director, Stacy Shaw, where is she? I think she's, there she is. She's coming through the back, just waving there. She has been our leader uh, through a very difficult period, and we are just, we're, this organization is healthier than it has ever been. This building is healthier than it has been in decades. And I'm just so grateful to be a part of it and grateful that you were here. Um, <clears throat> tonight is a special night. Again, it is the third in a series of uh, films that we are presenting as part of the Science on Screen um, series. And the Science on Screen series is a national uh, happening uh, that kicked off in March. Uh, the event is sponsored by the Coolidge Corner and by the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation. And the idea is to bring excitement and awareness, uh, awareness of scientific uh, content and scientific things through the lens of film. Uh, on our first night, we showed Star Trek and had a brief discussion about uh, uh, many of the technologies that you see in the movies that ultimately become everyday useful objects that we have. Our second film was Don't Look Up. And as, um, as a preamble to that film, we had uh, three professionals, a neuroscientist, a climatologist, and an astronomer from the Science Museum of Virginia debate, in a friendly way, what the subject matter of the uh, film actually was. Um, tonight, we have another Richmond native, Dr. Sarah McClellan, who was an assistant professor of US history at Virginia State University. She specializes in the history of technology. Her current research focuses on the pioneering role women played in the development of computing at NASA during the Cold War. She examines their contributions in the fields of supersonic and space research, their experiences in the workplace, and how uh, those experiences shape our perceptions of this technology today. Her research began as an oral history project conducted for NASA at Langley that collected interviews with women who worked in computing and engineering. Dr. McClellan's research won the Robinson Prize from the Society for the History of Technology in 2015, and she has also presented her work at NASA Langley at the Berkshire Conference of Women Historians and the Gender and Technology Symposium hosted by the College of William and Mary. So if you were wondering, yes, this is going to be an erudite and scintillating discussion, <laughs> but historically significant and uh, particularly, um, I think, uh, appropriate that it focuses so much on the contribution of women. Mm -hmm. uh, as part of the oral history project she did for the Cultural Resources Department at NASA Langley, she interviewed women who worked in space research during the Cold War and met Margot Lee Shetterly, who authored the book Hidden Figures. Uh, she also joined uh, the author, the director, and the producer of the film Hidden Figures for a tour of the space program sites at Langley when they came out to do background research. The working title of her uh, talk tonight is derived from a quote by uh, Katherine Johnson, captured during one of those oral interviews, when she said, I was a computer when the computer wore a skirt. Tonight you will screen the film Hidden Figures. It is uh, um, a documentary drama, if you will. It is a narrative film that's based on real life. 
Uh, and with no further ado, presenting her talk, Dr. Sarah McClellan. Thank you so much for being here. All right, well, good evening, everybody. And it's so great to be here to talk to you all. So I hope we get some good information, but also that we have some fun information and some interesting things about women, technology, space, um, and computers. So uh, you already heard about how the title of this talk actually comes from a quote from Katherine Johnson, who you'll meet in the film today. Um, and to kind of get us started, I wanted to begin uh, with these pictures. So these are the three women who you will see today portrayed in the film, and they are actual people who live. Um, you can see they each had a very long career at NASA. So I wanted to start by talking a little bit about their history, why we saw women in computing at NASA, um, how they became such a major part of aerospace computing, and also a little bit about what that means for us today and the impact of things like films like Hidden Figures. So, I want to start out with this picture. Um, the person on the far right, uh, you can't really see the caption, but that is Mary Jackson, who you'll meet in the film. And this is from the mid-1950s. So Mary Jackson is a great example of the kind of typical experience that is also very exceptional of these women who worked as um, computers at NASA. She was hired in 1951 launched into a very long career, um, began in a segregated unit for African Americans called the West Area Computers, because Virginia was still segregated at that time. Uh, but eventually, she moves into a research unit. Um, she pursues her education, becomes an engineer, and in 1958, becomes one of the first African American women to become an engineer um, ever. So she has a really long and storied career, and then later she will actually shift um, into working to promote the hiring um, and promotion of women at NASA itself. So she also funnels her own achievements and sort of breaking barriers into helping other people do the same. But to kind of understand how all of this happened and the backstory to our film today, we have to kind of jump back in time a little bit and change maybe some of the ways we think about computers um, and also even about NASA. So the first thing I want you all to know is when Mary Jackson and these other women were hired, uh, computers were actually people. So before we had the first electronic digital computers starting in the 1940s, um, computing were, was mathematicians doing calculations by hand, using things like slide rules. And that's what all of these women were initially hired to do. So they take part in the aerospace research that is being done. Um, they do calculations that are really important in um, calculating components and flights and trajectories and everything else. But originally, their job title was computers. And that's what they were known as. So that goes back to Katherine Johnson's quote, I was a computer when the computer wore a skirt. And at NASA, this labor was done um, all by women. So I want to talk a little bit about why and how that happened. But we also have to talk briefly about the history of NASA. So before 1958, it was actually known as the NACA, focused on aeronautical research. But after Sputnik, um, the U.S. decided to focus on space research, and that's when NASA became NASA. So most of these women actually worked there um, before that change, but as you'll see in the film, they continue to contribute for space research. So this is what research looked like back in the 1930s and 40s. These are giant wind tunnels. You'd have rushes of air going through. You'd put models in them, and that's how you would know, uh, research the aerodynamics of different components. And so as you can see, these are massive. And so the tests would take place, they would collect data, and then the calculations would be done to refine that research. But this project that I started with, the oral history project, actually began with this picture. This is from World War II. World War II is a really important moment for NACA. It grows. Um, there's one base originally in Hampton, Virginia. And over the course of World War II, we'll start to see more bases formed, and then additional ones later with NASA. But World War II caused a huge increase in staff and also the need for people to do calculations. So the first women were hired as computers in the 30s, but World War II really drove hiring. Um, they needed women to do calculations as NACA became really central for aeronautics, um, all of the bomber planes that were being used in World War II. So this is a 
Warbond Rally in 1943. And my boss at NASA and Cultural Resources found this photo and they started to research who are these people and especially who are all these women? Because prior to World War II, there was about one ninth of the workforce at NASA was women. So you can also see in the inset picture um, some of the women in the West Area computers that you'll see featured in the film today. So this project really began as kind of a mystery to discover what was in this photo and uncover the history. So we started looking into who some of these people were. And actually we found out um, this history wasn't totally hidden. And this is something that Margot Lee Shirley writes about in her book too. It's just history that got overlooked. So this is an article from the African American newspaper in Norfolk featuring one of the women hired to be a computer uh, during World War II. So these newspapers have a lot of information. We also see programs by NASA in the 90s um, talking to some of these women about their contributions. And it was very known in the community. So once we started researching this and sending out notices, we had people saying, oh yeah, my aunt or my grandmother or um, a family friend worked at NASA. And so we realized this history was out there. It just wasn't really widely known. So another reason we see, especially for African-American women, these opportunities opening up is that during World War II, uh, because of the efforts of civil rights leaders like A. Philip Randolph, President Roosevelt desegregated federal hiring and defense industries. So it opened up a lot of jobs that hadn't been accessible to African Americans. So at Langley, they started to recruit women, uh, both white and African American, who had colleges degrees in math and sciences. And it was really portrayed as an effort to help your country and be patriotic and support it in the war effort. Um, we also see, as you can see in these articles, uh, the federal government ran these emergency training programs to train people in engineering and other technical skills for the war. And local HBCUs, historically black universities like Hampton, excuse me, Hampton in Hampton, Virginia, um, ran these programs. So the other thing is where Langley was located, there was also colleges right there who were helping to train some of these women, and then they were also being recruited um, from other universities, HBCUs, women's colleges um, across the South. So I mentioned that computers used to be human, and you can see here, here's some of the kind of stuff they would do. They would work on these big adding machines um, using slide rules, doing paper calculations. The other thing about hiring women for computing, it's an incredible opportunity, and these are very well-educated women, um, women aren't getting hired in engineering at all in this point in history. So this is a huge opportunity, but they are classified as sub-professional, which means if you came in as a junior engineer that was professional, you'd be on research groups and research reports that would help you get in line for promotions. But the computing section for women was set up as its own unit. And you had a lot of references to it as being like a clerical pool or a typing pool. So even though these women were doing work, that was involving complex mathematics, and it was work the engineers had had to do on their own before, and they had the same college degrees as many of the men hired as junior engineers. Because they were women, they got put into a separate category. So their work wasn't getting the full recognition that could lead to promotions um, because they were seen as a separate women's group of workers. So one of the things we see in this story is incredible opportunities, but also the challenges and barriers um, that these women work to overcome. And we see them individually pushing against a lot of those and then also changes in laws and policy that happen as we go. So this is um, how you would have calculated aerodynamics in this early period before actual electronic computers. Um, these are tubes with liquid. It's called a manometer board. It measures pressure changes. So you take a whole set of readings as you did the wind tunnel. That's part of what would go into calculations that the computers would do. But as I mentioned, by the end of World War II in 1945, we have some of the first electronic and digital computers. And what we don't often think about today is actually women had a really central role in the history of computing from its very origins, um, not just with the mathematicians and human computing, but in programming um, in these early computers. So this is the ENIAC, 
one of the first computers built in the US, um, and it was programmed by women, you see them here. Now once again in the 1940s, when they did all the press releases for this, they featured some of the engineers who built the hardware. You didn't see the women in the photos, and it wasn't actually until the 1990s that we went back and looked at a lot of the documents and photos from the time to see the integral role that these women played in programming. And so it's really similar to what we see happening at NASA, that there's a lot of contributions that are acknowledged at the time on the local level, but it didn't make it into our bigger histories of how we think about technology and computing and things like that. So computing technology is gonna develop um, over time and it doesn't look anything like we have today. So we all have our phones, right? Huge computing power and this little tiny um, object. But at the time you were doing programming maybe on magnetic tape, or on things like this, a punch card. So your program would get punched into a whole series of cards. You had hundreds of these that you put in order and run through the machine to actually perform calculations. So as computing technology develops and we start to see these first digital electronic computers, the human computers at Langley start to take on these programming roles and they actually start to develop programs for aeronautical and also aerospace research. And they're the ones who learn how to use this technology and apply it to aerospace research. So they actually grow with the development of computing as a technology from the very first years up. And because of the Cold War and the space race, um, Langley continues to employ and hire women for computing. Um, because a lot of women after World War II um, lose their jobs and are you know, kind of sent home uh, and say, you know, uh, men need jobs and women don't need to work. But because of the demands of the Cold War and the space race development and research, uh, NASA continued to hire a lot of women, really until the 70s. That's when we started to see um, a little bit more of a crunch there. Um, and they'll hire women who are married, who have kids. Um, so there's actually a lot of opportunity and some flexibility because of the skill these women had um, and that they could bring to the table. So I just have a couple of pictures of people working on old computers. Um, this, you can see some of the cards in the bottom right of this picture. And computers at this time, you know, took up a whole room. Um, these huge sort of mainframes. Uh, let me, sorry. You can see a couple more examples of some of these huge room-sized computers. And then this one's a little bit more modern, um, into the 60s, but you can still see, you know, all the computing components in the background. So, it's a really different look. Took a lot of labor. Um, and the programming and operation were all kind of blended together. Um, as Katherine Johnson said, you were making it up and learning it and developing it as we went along. So this is Katherine Johnson. You've heard a lot about her today. You'll see her in the film as well. Um, she becomes very famous. She comes into Langley in the early 1950s. She starts out in that segregated West Area's computer unit, but pretty soon she's transferred and she becomes one of the first women to work on what's called the Space Task Force. So NASA Langley was really involved in the early space missions. Um, so Katherine Johnson is involved in a lot of that research and she famously helps calculate some of the trajectories for John Glenn as well. And you'll see a kind of dramatized version of that in the film. She really did double check the electronic computer's calculations, um, but it wasn't quite as last minute as it was portrayed in the film. Um, so there's a little bit of dramatic license that happens there. Um, but she also has a decades long career at NASA Langley. Um, she actually just passed away in 2020. She lived to be 103. Um, so she was here to see the film. She got a Presidential Medal of Freedom. Um, some of the buildings on the Langley campus are now named after her. So uh, we can kind of see the big impact that some of this research in telling these stories has made um, and just kind of getting this recognition out there. And the women you see in the film today are just a few of hundreds of African-American and white women who worked for Langley um, over the course of 1935 into the present. So you can see here Melba Roy, um, more features in the local paper, and she's working on an early IBM computer um, and also featured in Ebony Magazine. So these stories were out there in the national press in the past, um, but again, we just kind of got lost and how we were telling some of these stories and histories moving forward. Um, and there's 
a lot of great information and images where you can see um, some of the retirements and reunions that Langley had. So as I mentioned, there's a lot of connections between the community, um, between people who work at NASA now and live in the local area and who knew some of these women. In fact, Marguerite Shetterly, who wrote the book, she grew up in Hampton and she knew these women from her church. And so she actually started working on her book research right around when I started um, doing my internship with NASA Langley. And um, she came to help do research, but also got a lot of great information from the sort of personal connection that she had. And her father actually worked as an engineer at Langley as well um, later in his life. So it's really kind of cool to think about the connections that people have as well um, and the way that that's helped kind of bring these stories out. So I wanted to kind of wrap up this little backstory um, with a woman you don't meet in the film, but who was also hugely significant. Uh, this is Dr. Christine Darnan, and she's hired later in the 60s. And I love to talk about her because she really comes in at this transitional point. So when Dr. Darnan is hired, um, it's the 1960s. She's uh, participated in civil rights protests. She has a master's degree. She knows multiple programming languages. She's still hired as a sub-professional computer. Um, and she said, you know, at the time, it was a very dead-end track because you could become lead computer, and that was it. So she worked for a few years writing programs, writing aerospace programs, not getting the full credit that she should have for those contributions. Finally went to talk to a supervisor about, you know, why aren't I able to get onto this track with the male engineers? And he was like, huh, no one really raised that with me before. So <laughs> she is able to... Um, get a promotion, she shifts, she starts to do research reports, she becomes an engineer, um, she does some major work on supersonic flight. But she's also interesting because she comes in when we see electronic computers really becoming the norm. So Dr. Darden said when she was hired, everyone called her a computer. And you know they said, oh yeah, you're one of the computers. And she's like, well, I'm a person. I'm not a computer, a computer is a machine. So you can really see how this perspective changes. You know, she's like, I program computers, I'm not one. So, you know, she comes in with this change of technology, kind of changing in social ideas, and she really helps push for some of these changes for women to get reclassified on that junior engineering track. And that eventually does happen, um, and computing becomes integrated into you know, mathematicians, junior engineers, um, in the sort of normal track of the civil service. Um, and I'll also mention that, you know, NASA has kind of a rocky road, you know, in terms of um, hiring and diversity, they do hire a lot of African American women, um, and then eventually men, but as I mentioned at first, Langley remains segregated, um, even into the 1950s. 1958 is when largely those segregated units end, when it becomes NASA. Um, but in the oral histories, a lot of the African American women still reported things like there being bathrooms that you should and shouldn't use, um, and signs put on cafeteria tables, and things like that. So it's a really interesting study as well. Um, and you see some of this in the film, but about how people operate, how you can build um, and sort of push down barriers and work across them but also how they appear in really weird ways, that you might be all working together on space research, but someone expects you to use a different bathroom. Um, you know, it's a really interesting look at how individual efforts, as well as sort of, you know, bigger changing laws and movements really reshape work. So by uh, 1972, NASA really highlights the fact that it has um, a lot of opportunities for women, for African Americans, for all kinds of people. Um, it's something that really becomes a point of emphasis. And of course, this is also part of the Cold War, um, the US you know, wanting to um, kind of promote its efforts um, for equality because all of the issues with civil rights and segregation and discrimination were a big issue in propaganda from the Soviet Union during the Cold War. So um, this kind of thing is good PR, but it also kind of shows the changes that have happened at the agency from kind of hiring people because of need to promoting um, the work that they have done and achieved um, in order to move forward with the agency. So um, here in the bottom picture, you see Margot Lee Shetterly, who is the author of the book the film is based on. And you also see um, some of the women who are featured um, in her book. And Katherine Johnson is down there in the front. So I kind of wanted to end by talking about how things like popular culture, like this film, um, can really bring these stories out there. So like I said, a lot of this was known in the community 
or at the time. Um, but these kind of stories can really get the information out. Um, and you know, it kind of gives a new platform, a new visibility um, to these kind of stories and history. And so they can kind of change how we think about things and the way we assume today that we know what a computer is or how it developed or who works in things like programming and development. Um, if we look at the history, it actually kind of opens things up and shows us that there's a lot more going on than we may think of um, when we just kind of look back um, with what we know today. So since I'm a history professor, I also have to leave y'all with some extra information. But if you're interested in comparing more history on film to actual history, um, NASA actually has this really cool page about um, hidden figures to modern figures. So you can find out a bit more about the women um, and some FAQs about the film itself. Uh, the three African-American women featured are living people. Uh, some of the other characters are kind of composites. Um, but you can read more about it there. And then, of course, there is Murderly Shadowly's book, which is really excellent, and there's a version for young readers, too. So if you're interested in knowing more about all of this, um, definitely check out the book and get more of this history. So thanks for sharing some time with me tonight. Um, the film will come up just as soon as we get this switched out, and I hope you guys enjoy it and have a good rest of your evening.